So this is a case study that builds on the other two lectures on, on, um, on back end of the fuel cycle, the fuel cycle discussion and also the general technology of reprocessing. And this gives a state case study of the safeguards that were implemented at the Rokasho reprocessing plant, the Japanese reprocessing plant that represents the uh, newest and latest technology. Some definitions, Rokasho reprocessing plant, RRP, it's opera, and these are acronyms because everybody gets locked in in the acronyms. I'll try to give you something in the, in the beginning. Uh, it's operated by Jap Japan Nuclear Fuel Limited, JNFL. It's the newest commercial uh, plant, reprocessing plant in the world. Um, Nuclear Material Control Center, NMCC. They're essentially the, st the Japanese state system of accounting control, SSAC. That's another word you hear kicked around in safeguards uh, uh, world, world. That's the equivalent of the NRC in the U.S. And another thing that's talked about in terms of the Rokasho is the on-site laboratory. And that's an analytical laboratory that's installed at the facility for joint use by the IAEA and the Japanese Regulatory Authority, NMCC. Um, seen this picture before, but this gives you an idea of the complexity of the site uh, at the RRP. Um, outline of the, what, what is the RRP? It's located in a Murray Prefecture in Japan, which is at the very north end of the main island. It's on a site that's about 3.8, uh, 3,800,000 square meters. <laughs> so what's that, 3,800 square, uh, square kilometers? There's 38 buildings involved. More than 20 contain major process equipment and storage buildings with some, some 1,700 kilometers of pipe 700 kilometers in the main process only. So when you're talking about keeping track of material and safeguards, it's within 20 buildings in more than 700 uh, kilometers of pipe and probably, I would say, 100 and some pieces of equipment. <clears throat> Max maximum manual processing is 800 tons of uranium or 8 tons of plutonium. Maximum processing rate is 4.8 tons of uranium per day. Uh, typically, it operates more at 4. Uh, their storage capacity for plutonium total uh, reco as recovered product is 30 tons, and stor storage for the vitrified waste packages is over 1,400. What's interesting and the reason it's used as such an example is the safeguards implementation at the RRP is the largest safeguards implementation ever undertaken by the IAEA. The Thorpe plant in the UK and the Kojima plant in France are equivalent size, but their IAEA uh, safeguards are not applied there because those are both in weapon states. And Japan is the only one that has a significant um, large capacity reprocessing plant that's in a non-weapon state. So the IAEA has considerable focus there. <clears throat> Here's the schedules. Uh, they first started build, uh, construction in 93. And it's uh, full-scale operation is still pending, and it's pending partly because of the Fukushima problem. But commissioning with irradiated test finally began with irradiated fuel finally began in 2006. So you can see the time involved in design and construction, and the time involved in implementing the safeguard systems. Um, <clears throat> JNFL, the, the IAEA and JNFL project to develop the safeguards was a joint effort that lasted throughout, almost throughout that, that whole time period. Um, its goal was to develop the efficient and effective safeguards approach, um, develop the methods and develop authenticated equipment, design and specify and procure all of the equipment that was needed, uh, build and establish the on-site laboratory, and conduct uh, what are called design information exercises, evaluations and design information verification throughout the time of construction. DIV, DIE, DIV, uh, design information, examination, design, these are the elements of the inspection. That's a process by which the operator declares what the facility is supposed to look like, what he intends to put in there, provides all the drawings to the IAEA, and the IAEA has the opportunity to go on site and be sure that the facility is built the way they said it was going to be built. And they're given 
the, all the design information that they can then lock up for their use at the facility. They can't take it with them, but they lock it up for their own use and the, the facility operator can't get back at it to make changes. So it's their mechanism of knowing what was supposed to be there and being, to go, being able to go back and make, uh, make uh, information. Uh, make uh, judgments on whether or not it's still the same. Uh, verification of monitoring is, of spent fuel with receipt and continuity of knowledge through storage or sharing. This is part of the safeguards approach. In other words, they want to verify and monitor all fuel that's received and into storage and be able to maintain a continuity of knowledge of that fuel from the time it's received on site through the storage and the time that it goes into processing. So they've installed equipment to be able to look and follow the fuel all the way through. Uh, application of something called shipper receiver difference, SRD. Um, that's the safeguards technique that's used for safeguards implementation in the head end of a reprocessing plant. That simply looks at the amount of material that's received in spent fuel versus what's actually measured in the input accountability vessel and makes a judgment about potential loss or diverge, diversion of material someplace within that uh, ac activity. Uh, part of the safeguards approach is verification of all flows and transfers. Um, essentially all transfers between material balance areas, on-site, off-site. Um, the, the, er the facility is divided into some five material balance areas and all flows between material balance areas are declared and the agency puts in procedures to verify uh, a, a significant number of those, if not all of the very important ones. Um, application of near real-time accountancy for the main process and code, de code denitration areas. I'll say a little bit more about that, but that is, that's an accountancy measure that's done essentially online to uh, check for any loss or diversion of material from the uh, main process or the code de denitration areas. Month, monthly interim inventory verifications to meet timeliness criteria. So they evaluate the near real time accountancy on a monthly basis. And they do an annual physical inventory taking and physical inventory verification. Those are the elements of the safeguards approach for Rocasho. Taking into account the large inventory and the throughput, um, additional uh, declarations and checks are made. These are generally referred to as um, operation is declared. In other words, the, uh, throughout the entire design information verification and examination period, they've determined how the facility is to be run. They get periodic notifications that the facility is running or not running or in standby mode or in process mode. And the ability to go and check a number of different parameters independently to verify the state of the facility and what's happening in the facility. And uh, the safeguards approach, approach includes measures to confirm the absence of undeclared activities. And complementary access environmental sampling is something that's new to IAEA safeguards that verifies that nothing else at the site is going on other than the declared activities. And by complementary access and environmental sampling, the agency people, have, the inspectors, have the opportunity to look in a lot of non-routine areas. The problem with Rocasho is that it's such a big effort. Uh, without unattended systems, in other words, if everything had to be checked manually with inspectors, they estimated the number of PDIs, personal days of inspection, would be 2,900 per year. The IAEA has available to itself, it's in, within all the inspectors that are there, somewhere around three to 4,000 PDIs total. So without unattended systems, they were looking at using essentially all of their resources to monitor this facility. So they had to come up with new and innovative techniques for safeguards application uh, using unattended systems and estimated they could reduce the number of PDIs to about 900 through a very, very extensive use of uh, unattended systems. In order to achieve this, it required a lot of technical solutions. The facility layout 
of repro and, and the areas of concern that are focused to the safeguards approach are the spent fuel cask storage area, the spent fuel receipt and storage area, the head end area where the process, initial processing of fuel to bring the assemblies in, chop them up, and dissolve them, the main process area, which includes separation, purification, and waste evaporation, or product evaporation, and then the waste handling areas, the, code, the, the, the conversion area for MOCs, and the analytical laboratories. Those are the main subdivisions of the plant that essentially compose the material balance areas, and all transfers between those have to be declared and, and validated. Accountancy verifications uh, verify flows into and out of material balance areas using uh, solution monitoring for transferred solutions, unattended sampling. Uh, the Rokasho has a system whereby you can stage a sample bottle and it will automatically dispatch that sample bottle to a location and pick up a sample and bring it back for IAEA verification purposes. Um, it's quite an effort to verify that sampling system. It includes on-site analysis of uh, those samples that are collected by various means. And it, reuse, it includes the use of uh, a number of NDA systems for unattended verification of solid waste and MOX product canisters. Verifying the declared inventory. At the time of the physical inventory taking, at the time of interim inventory taking, at the time of near real-time accounting. Those are all separate, difficult problems. Uh, physical inventory taking is when the plant is completely shut down and everything's in a location and you can go and look at it. Interim inventory taking and at the time of near real-time accounting is a much diff more difficult problem because you have to set a time the plant is continuing to operate, and you have to establish a cutoff time, and you have to measure the inventory throughout that entire plant at that moment. Unattended methods are implemented to minimize the inspection effort for all of these verification of flows. For the front end areas, spent fuel receipts are automatically verified. In other words, there are unattended radiation sensors that are kept under containment and surveillance. And when a cask is, is received and they take the fuel out of the cask, it has to pass through a channel where there are unattended sensors that can detect the movement, direction and movement of fuel assemblies past the location. So independently, there's a declaration by the operator that we received a particular cask on a certain day. And then in an unattended mode, the agency inspectors have access to un, uh, unattended data that was collected that verifies the time and the direction of movement of assemblies from the cask to the storage area. Unattended, uh, th there's also unattended um, containment and surveillance records. They actually, lo they actually have a camera that can see and uh, independently verify the uh, identification on the fuel assembly as it passes into the storage location. Spent th fuel movements through the chopping are automatically verified and tracked by unattended radiation sensors and cameras. They have p installed pieces of equipment through the wall that contain neutron sensors and cameras that can sense, it's along the, the, the normal process that a particular fuel assembly flows from the pool to the shear. And it can tell when the fuel assembly passes and by the different locations it can tell the direction. So it's an independent verification of the declarations of when an assembly comes into the plant and when it goes into the shearing. And as it comes up out of the plant, there's a camera, an unattended camera, that records the, uh, the uh, identification of the fuel assembly. A very interesting thing about uh, hulls, unattended monitoring of the containers by radiation detectors and cameras, unattended identification by surveillance cameras, and the hulls monitor for in unattended independent verification of the quantities. Hulls that come out of the dissolver 
are collected and put into very tall, round containers. I forget the dimensions. It's probably like four feet by six feet or something like that. And those containers are then sealed up and welded. And they move through a standard route. And again, there's detection uh, neutron monitors that detect the passage of those things and the passage into a monitor system that quantitatively measures the amount of material that's left in the hulls. That's an operator controlled and owned piece of equipment that produces the, in the, the declaration of how much is in there. It's a, it's a I believe it's a, a, an activated neutron measurement, but I'm not exactly positive of that. The IAEA has independent cross checks on using some neutron tubes to verify the declaration. And then they can see the hull's container moving out and going to the, lo the long-term disposal area. They know the time and the direction of the movement. Input accountability tank is the most important measurement in the whole facility. Um, unattended automatic sampling is applied. That's where I, say, I, t I said before they can stage sample bottles which are dispatched to the location to pick up a sample. They're returned back to the on-site laboratory for analysis. Analysis is done um, by in the on-site laboratory using a um, non-destructive method called hybrid K-edge densitometry. They measure 100% of the samples by that method and they measure 10 percent by mass spectrometry as a measurement control check. All the declarations and the quantities are independently uh, verified by independent agency installed volume measurement equipment. Completely independent uh, agency owned and controlled equipment that's used to then verify the declaration from the operator. Plutonium nitrate product going from the process to the main conversion area is again uh, checked 100% by unattended samples, uh, independent analysis in the on-site laboratory, and solution monitoring for double check of the flow of material and double check of the uh, declared quantities. Solution monitoring is very important in a lot of places because it gives a very, very precise indication of solution movement between independent vessels in the main process line. So anything that gets transferred from one to the other, it needs to go and, and it's cross-checked in terms of ship versus received. And so it very carefully that no material is actually transferred out of the main process line and all material that moves through the main process line is is uh, is 100 percent verified. Transfer of MOX product to storage. The MOX product cans are independently measured with an unattended measurement system, the plutonium canister assay system. That's a combined neutron and gamma measurement. The it's totally unattended. Um, the the operator in 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 his automated um, process moves the canister into that particular piece of equipment. The measurement is made automatically. The verification measurement is made automatically for the IAEA, and it's compared to the declaration by the operator. Um, they have the ability to also do analysis of samples that might be taken in the on-site laboratory. Uh, solid waste transfers, this is the junk stuff that's left over. These are very difficult measurements to make because they're very low levels of material in a lot of density of junk. They can be, it can consist of failed pieces of equipment like pumps and, and other pieces of equipment. It consists of trash that's picked up, you know, uh, contamination trash papers. Uh, probably the most significant and dis difficult one is the analytical waste from the laboratory, which can have residuals of plutonium in it. Those vials and things are packaged into drums and that actually goes through this thing called the waste drum assay system, WDAS. The, the waste crate assay system monitors the rest of the trash that gets uh, picked up and transferred. Uh, both of those are unattended systems. There's a very sophisticated me measurement system by the operator 
um, actually developing the verification measurements with these things was quite a difficult problem. Um, they tried a number of different ways, but for the most part, they have left it to uh, periodic unattended uh, check with a handheld device to verify what's done by the, the operator's systems. And finally, unattended verification and monitoring of the vitrified waste. Here the issue is one where the waste has to be vitrified. And so they're looking to find a way to be sure that all the waste went to the melter and that in the end, they actually melted the glass and didn't leave liquid in it. So there's a number of cross-checks in, in this thing called a vitrified canister, canister assay system that uses um, um, some, uh, what's, what's the right word? Uh, chambers, the U-235 chamber and 238 chamber, fission chambers. And so they use that uh, as a measure, as an indication of whether or not the, uh, it's been vitrified. And they use solution monitoring from this big tank into the vitrifier to be sure that all the material goes into it. So in the end, there's over 2,000 flow verifications per year. And the safeguards approach provides for unattended verification of the flows. Inspectors required only to the review the data, which you can imagine results in a very sophisticated and complex automatic data collection system and a data evaluation software, which was quite difficult to develop and implement. Near real-time accountancy, every five days, NRTA was applied to the main process area and conversion area. And they evaluate the uh, material unaccounted for and something called the D statistic, which has to do with the difference between declaration and the verification measurement. It's a kind of a, a hocus-pocus um, statistical technique that the IAEA uses. But the key is that every five days, they have to declare what the inventory is. And the IAE has to have the ability to verify it. The declaration is particularly difficult because you've got a hundred and some pieces of equipment that you have to declare the inventory of. And you can't just go and inventory all those at one time, at one instant. For a, in, so they have a very sophisticated system to monitor the material based upon continuous process measurements and process control measurements and transfers and use in solution monitoring. And there's, they've narrowed it down to where there's only three locations where they actually have to pull samples in the dynamic locations of the fill, vessel, the fill vessels off of the various systems where they have to get it at the right time. Everything else is a sophisticated calculation in time to be able to draw the conclusion at a particular stated inventory uh, moment. It involves the operator declared inventory, uh, agency verification of those, because they have to now, now know what the time of the cutoff is and what the time of the inventory is, and they have to go back to their um, process monitoring data to be able to verify what the, the operator uh, declares. One important thing is in the conversion area, most of that material is in a solid form. And so there's a very sophisticated system called plutonium inventory measurement system that allows them to make an independent measurement of the holdup in, in all of the process equipment at a particular location. In fact, that piece of equipment is structured so that it measures the total holdup every 20 minutes. And they can then declare the inventory cutoff time, pick the appropriate measurement, look at it in relation to the, all the other ones to come up with their declaration. And the IAEA has been able to implement an independent data collection system off of that plutonium inventory measurement system to use in evaluation of the declaration. Approximately every 30 days, they have to take those five-day um, NRTA and do another inventory and draw a conclusion based upon five, essentially, material balance closures during the 30-day period. 
The IIV involves, again, the automated NRTA for the main process and the automated NRT for the a NRTA for the conversion area. Shipper receiver difference is an evaluation of the inventory verification for the head end. That's where, on a 30-day basis, they essentially have to declare an inventory in the head end. They have to know the total amount that was processed in terms of receipt and the quantities associated with the spent fuel assemblies and the total number of batches that were measured in the input accountability vessel and essentially close the material balance on that area. Uh, verification in the inventory in the mock storage area is one of containment surveillance. They have, uh, uh, they have neutron detectors through the entire path of movement of the plutonium product storage cans into the storage area and then there's um, monitoring on the, all the exit, potential exits out of that storage area. It's an unattended area. It's completely automated. There's no personnel involvement in it. So they, they monitor the, 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 the ingress and egress with neutron detectors. Verification of inventory in the waste treatment and storage area, that's one of just using the monitor, the, uh, the, um, the solution monitoring information. Thus, every 30 days, the entire facility is evaluated using the automatic data collection and evaluation system. Once per year, they shut the clean out the whole facility and shut it down and measure the resid and, and essentially reduce the material to almost nothing in the whole plant and do an, and do another in, in a year end physical inventory declaration complete physical inventory is taken and the material balance for each uh, MBA is verified over the year technology was needed and all the support programs to the IAEA helped out considerably to provide that unattended uh, capability. Data collection and evaluation, um, it's a very sophisticated network that has to reach out to all the installed unattended verification systems. It has to collect information from those systems and consolidate it in a single location. And all the transfers of data have to be authenticated in some way, that there's no tampering of information from the location the, the data source to the um, data collection and storage area. So the, the number of industrial sensors were installed at local areas, uh, local computer and processing and local buffering, and then onto an, in, uh, an Ethernet system and collected in what they call a um, remote database. And the remote database serves both the IAEA and the, the, um, the Japanese uh, um, regulatory authority as well. So this is a typical network that has um, sensors in an IAEA cabinet or in a building, and they go to a, a central location in a, a particular building in an inspector cabinet, and then that's then transferred to, there's, as I said, there's there, well, here it shows um, six, nine buildings. So there's nine local data collection areas that then transfer to the inspector building and the inspector database. Data evaluation system is very complex, and I'm not sure that it's even at this point been totally and completely implemented because there's so many different parts of it. Um, you can see that it uh, revolves around the IAEA database, and there's all these sub-evaluation called accountancy, solution monitoring, all the NDA devices, authentication of sampling, all the DIE and DIV. All that has to be processed and all uh, centered and software that's available to the inspectors to use on site. Required support. Um, I guess I could just read it, but uh, you can read it just as well as I do. Um, the procedures for calibration of the vessels, um, that was a very extensive uh, uh, effort to be there to witness and uh, independently verify all the calibration of all the vessels, some hundred and some vessels. Um, development of the equipment for authentication of signals. Um, there was a significant effort put into design of the uh, uh, cabinets 
and how the information was going to be stored in the cabinets and what was going to be the method to authenticate the, the data transfers, uh, all of the installations had to go through a vulnerability assessment to be sure that they were, that they were confident that there were no ways that the operator could uh, influence the information that was being processed. Uh, provision for authenticated data. This is where it, some things were split from operator information, so they had to have a way to authenticate that the piece of equipment was operating and gain assurance that, um, that the information had not been tampered with in any way uh, by the operator through his ability to access his own equipment and that the, the signals that were passed were from that equipment were delivered properly to the uh, IAEA data collection system. And development of the required data collection and evaluation software, that was a very, very extensive uh, uh, process to develop all of those evaluation uh, softwares for all those pieces of equipment. And then, of course, in installation and developing the operation techniques and uh, all of the uh, technologies for the on-site laboratory. In summary, um, JNFL project was established to develop and implement that safeguard system. It took a tremendous cooperation between the IAEA, the Japanese authority, and the operator. Um, it took advantage of uh, cooperation with the state system of accounting and control, and that was a very significant effort was to understand the mechanism for transferring the declarations from the state system to the IAEA in timely way that sort of stretched the way, uh, stretched the way things had typically been done in the past. And of course, the operation of the OSL was extremely sensitive because there you have a radiological uh, facility on the site of an operator being operated by people that are not directly under the control of the operator. So there was a lot of negotiation and a lot of effort to implement the on-site laboratory and to negotiate the ways to handle waste transfers and transfers between the facilities. Um, and then, of course, the whole uh, design information evaluation in DIV was a very, very long and involved procedure that involved quite a bit of cooperation between all of the parties involved. Uh, you can imagine the coordination that you can only look at a piece of equipment in construction for a certain length of a time. So there has to be a cooperation between the construction people, the schedulers, the, the nuclear material control center, and the IAEA to get the people there at the right time to look at things in the right way just before they were finished with it and to maintain a continuity of knowledge on things that had been checked. And that's short and simple. <laughs>